Good morning, church. Here we are once again, and we realize that it's another Lord's Day, and that out of his, his goodness, his grace, and his mercy, he has blessed us that we are here once again, and for that we, we thank him. And our lesson for today, our background scripture, comes from Zephaniah, the third chapter. Our print passage is Zephaniah, the third chapter, the 14th through the 20th verse. And our subject for today is the return of Job. And as we have been uh, talking about uh, the justice of the Lord, we have uh, experience the prophecy of, of various prophets and our prophet for today is Zephaniah and, and he like so many others uh, before him uh, is speaking of the day of the Lord. Uh, our lesson print focuses on his restoration of what he plans to do but as our subject says the return of joy it, it brings about a question of what happened to the joy in the first place. And we know that the Lord was, was displeased uh, with his people. And so to understand where this return comes from, we're going to go back uh, to Zephaniah, uh, the first chapter. And I'm going to read uh, the second through the fourth verse. And he says, I will utterly consume all things of the land saith the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked and I will cut off man off the land, saith the Lord. Now this doesn't paint a picture of joy. It paints a picture of justice. It paints a picture of destruction, of darkness, of, of doom. And so we move on down a little uh, to the 12th verse, and he says, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their leaves and that say in their heart, The Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. As if to say, he's not going to do anything because he hasn't done anything yet. And we've often talked about the patience of the Lord. But it seems that some would take the patience of the Lord for weakness. And so this prophet is, is painting this picture that he is coming back to destroy. He is coming back for those that say that the Lord has no teeth. He hasn't shown them yet. He hasn't done anything. They said he will do neither good nor evil. And so the prophet is, is letting us know that the apathy of God's people who have not changed their ways, who have not turned from their sins, who have not sought the Lord, who believe that this isn't going to happen. In fact, the Lord is not going to do anything. And so we need to know that although this beginning uh, prophecy point paints a picture of, of the destruction of the judgment of the Lord, we know that the Lord will never leave his kingdom without some witnesses. So as we look at the second chapter of Zephaniah and, and the third verse, he gives us some instruction. He says, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. He's given a warning that if I were you, I would seek him. And that maybe, just maybe, out of his grace and out of his mercy, that you may be able to avoid the wrath and the anger of the Lord. And so we move on to the 12th verse in the second chapter. He says, and, and by he I'm talking about the Lord. He says, I will also leave in the midst of these an afflicted and poor people. And they shall trust 
in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. So now we come to the point of our lesson print for today. For after the Lord has pronounced judgment, after he has spoken about the destruction to come, after he has spoken about the willful disobedience of his people and what that's going to bring, we then talk about a vision that this prophet Zephaniah had about restoration, about retribution, about the, about the Lord withholding his judgment on his people. And so this prophet tells us that we have a reason to celebrate. And so our 14th verse, he says, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil anymore. My, 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 isn't the grace of God, isn't his mercy a wonderful thing that even though man didn't deserve it, he is, through the prophet, announcing a restoration, announcing a reason to shout, announcing a reason to sing. And so he tells them that we have to learn to live without fear for in the 16th and 17th verse, he says, fear not, fear not. So what do I have to fear? Because the man of God has spoken for God in saying that there is no reason to fear. Why is there no reason to fear? Because God himself will be in their midst. And he tells us that therefore, the Lord tells his people, let not thine hands be slack. What is he saying? You know, when we say fear not, you know what fear is? Fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of joy. Fear is the very thing that will inhibit man from praising God. If you've ever been fearful, if you've ever been afraid, I doubt that you found yourself in a position to praise God, to honor him for what fear tends to do is to paralyze us. It tends to take us out of a spirit of worship. And thus he, he warns us to fear not. He said, let not thine hands be slack, meaning let nothing stop you from praising him. Fear is not of God. Fear is of the enemy. Fear tends to stop us from praising. So God says, fear not. And the reason that you don't have a reason to fear is because my prophet has spoken my word. He has spoken my will that there is no reason to fear because now I am in the midst of thee. And we might say, well, why not be fearful? Why not become, be overcome by despair? We're in times of despair. We're in times of sadness and sickness and all kind of disease. But God is the maker and creator of us all. There is no thing, there is no circumstance, no sickness, no disease that is larger than the God that we serve. So when the man of God, speaking for God, said, fear not, those of us who know the power of God have no reason to fear him. We are to live this life without fear. We are to live this life in expectancy of the promise of God because his word has spoken it. And so we come to the point where we hear what God says that he's going to do. We hear how he speaks of this restoration. And I'm going to read from the 19th verse and he says, behold, at that time, that time being the day of the Lord, when, when most would expect judgment, most would expect destruction and calamity. He said, at that time, speaking about 
his people. He says, I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halted, and gather her that was driven out, and I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. And that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you for, I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. What is our God saying to us today? He is saying that this remnant of people that I will save, who will be my witnesses, who will speak for me, will move from despair to jubilation, will move from sadness to joy, will move from shame to fame because he's going to make your name great among the nations. And there's nobody that can do that but him. He is a restorer of souls. He is a lifter up of bow down heads. There is a reason to shout. There is a reason to sing. For God has spoken it. And this is to Israel. This is to Judah. What does that mean to you today? He's talking to you and he's talking to me. That if you would seek me, that if you would turn from your wicked ways, if you would seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and heal the land. God has spoken it. He has proclaimed it. Zephaniah here, he's no different from Isaiah. He's no different from the many other prophets who have spoken the word of the Lord. What's the problem? The problem is only that we hear. The problem is only that we heed. The word has been spoken. It's been prophesied. It has come through the mouth of the prophet from our God. All that is needed is that man, that the people of God, heed the word of God. He is a restorer. He is a rejuvenator. He is one that brings retribution. He is able to turn it all around. He is the designer. He is the creator. He is the sustainer. And what is so good about this God is that as this prophecy started out, it painted a picture where there was no hope. It painted a picture where there was nothing but gloom and doom. But all because of the mercy, the grace, and the love of our God, that this prophet can speak of restoration. He can speak of bringing God's people back from the places that they have been driven. Come out of the shadows and into the light, for God is a restorer of your very soul, only if you would heed his word. So we appeal to you, we call out to you, hear the word of the Lord today, Seek him while he may be found, for there is nothing and no one situation that he cannot undo or restore. He is God, and he is God all by himself. Today, give him glory and give him honor for his marvelous and wondrous works. We thank you, and we pray that you be blessed. Let the church say, amen.